All right, welcome in. Get settled. We're gonna get started in just one minute. Happy Thursday, everyone. All right, we'll get started. So welcome everyone to the second Converse with a Conservator. Um, I wanna, you know, do my, the art doctor is in and today we have a very special guest that I'll get to in just a moment, but I always like to start with a little bit of housekeeping. So first off, please keep your internet browser open because at the end of the program, we have a survey which will pop up. And since this is our second in the survey in the series, we really wanna get your feedback. Um, a big thank you to my intern, Armando Rivera. He is behind the scenes working to help with any tech issues. So if you have any questions or concerns, please use the chat box and he will get back with you. We also are offering closed captioning today, so please feel free to hit the CC button to take advantage of that. Um, a little bit about this program. So this is the monthly series in which you talk to a different conservator. I will serve as your trustee seed and moderator, and we will get through as many questions as we can in the 45 minutes. So please send us your questions in the Q&A box. I have it open. Um, another thing is that we are recording this, so only the panelists mic and audio are on, but we'll have the questions down as written, and um, we're also hoping to offer this online on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, Dan, could you go to the next slide, please? Oh, and we already hit that, so go on to the next one after that. All right, so we are based here at Smithsonian American Art Museum, even though Dan and I right now are in our homes, but we want to gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here in Washington, D.C., the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we're gathered, and the labor of people who were enslaved in constructing the historic building that is now the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, Dan, next slide. So we are uh, all about Sam's, again, Smithsonian American Art Museum, we go by Sam for short, the Lunder Conservation Center. And if you haven't been, it was the first visible art conservation space on permanent display in an art museum. So we have visible labs. Um, the one we're gonna be talking about today, our time-based media lab is actually the newest and not visible lab. However, we just opened up a whole time-based media interpretation space on the fourth floor. So the next time you're at the museum, please check it out. So I am Laura Hoffman. Again, I'm your moderator. I'm the program manager for Lunder Conservation Center. So I am in charge of the program. So that's why I really wanna hear all your feedback after this program. We are gonna be speaking with Dan Finn, our media conservator. Um, and I want to get us started before, my first question for you will be to, to tell us a little bit about you as well as how you came to be at SAM. But first, Dan, how about we launch a quick poll to just see where our audience is with their time-based media trivia. All right. Hopefully everyone sees the poll. It's only two questions, so give it a go now. There will be no penalties for incorrect answers. All right, the votes are starting to come in. It's so cool to see all of this in real time. So the first question I'll read out loud is, when was the earliest artwork in Sam's time-based media collection? Dinwell's, actually Dan, can you tell me the pronunciation for this artwork and the artist? Uh, Donnell Grant's Contra Themis. Contra Themis. Okay, so when was it created? So 1941, 1918, 1963, or 1995. And the second question is, what celebrity narrowly missed out on developing the world's first videotape system? Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Bing Crosby, or Sammy Davis Jr.? 
All right, I'll give people another 10 seconds to lock in their vote, although it looks like people have mostly answered. So I'm gonna end this and Dan, you can reveal the answers. All right, so the winning one was, or we'll see, but the answers that were chosen for the first one was 1963. Is that correct, Dan? 1941. Joinel Grant's contrafemis 16 millimeter film uh, where the artist hand drew uh, a lot of imagery on the film itself to create the images is from 1941. All right, what about question two, which celebrity? So the one that was chosen was Bing Crosby. Is that correct? Bing Crosby is correct. Oh. Here's the team at Bing Crosby Enterprises uh, looking at a very, important piece of paper, it seems like. Uh, they narrowly missed out uh, when Ampex beat them to the punch with their two inch quads system. Very interesting. Okay, In well, Crosby. that was very fun to start that off on. Dan, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to working here as a media conservator at SAM? Sure, um, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, yeah, I, I like it started, I got interested in a, in a graduate program that a couple of friends told me about that was at New York University, their moving image archiving and preservation program. Uh, I'd taken cinematography in uh, undergrad and we shot 16 millimeter film. So I really liked film and, uh, so I was interested in a, in, a, in a career in being able to maybe preserve film. And uh, what really sealed the deal with that program was I was able to look at student work on their website. And they had uh, past students' um, projects. And one student had done a thesis on Discord Records, which is a DC-based punk record label. And so I thought, well, here's this. Uh, route for me to be able to wrap up all of my interests in maybe. Music, film, media, seems interesting. And then um, after graduating from that, I got my first job at the Smithsonian, but at the National Museum of African American History and Culture as a media archivist, which is slightly different from a media conservator. And I was there for 10 months helping set up uh, a digitization lab for video, for audio, taking old videotapes, printing them into digital files, taking old audio tapes and turning those into digital files. Um, and then this job opened up at SAM and I didn't think I was really qualified for it, but my boss really pushed me to do it, to apply. And it involved needing somebody to build a lab. And so I think my experience helping with building the labs at Namak is what pushed me over the edge. And so now I'm an uh, art conservator and a very quick difference about a media archivist and a media conservator. Uh, archives tend to have a whole bunch of stuff, like thousands of VHS tapes, thousands of audio tapes, tens of thousands even. And so you have to think about what you're gonna do for all of that huge bulk of material. Our collection is relatively small. Time-based media at SAM is, um, we've got some new stuff coming in, so we're gonna break 160. Um, and so I get to spend a lot of time on a smaller number of things. So it feels like more, uh, I get to do a lot more research on individual artworks and that's really enjoyable. That's great. And very exciting to hear that, uh, we're coming up to the 160 mark there. So Dan, just to get everyone on the same playing field, I've personally heard time-based media described in several different ways. So I wanna know how do you personally define time-based media in Sam's collection specifically? It's a, it's a catch-all and in, in the museum world, there's a few of them, uh, moving images, electronic media, time-based media, variable media. What they're all trying to get at is how do you deal with things like films or videotapes, analog video, digital video, audio. Um, software based art, computer artworks, and performance. And um, somebody thought, well, all those things take place over time. 
And uh, so they thought, well, sculptures and paintings have dimensions that are normally given in two or three dimensions, height, width, depth. Um, Time-based media works have a, a time duration because they, they have a, a, some sort of duration or interactivity. And so at, at SAM, it means film, analog video, digital video. Uh, we have a few video games, it means video games. Uh, Software-based art. And uh, we don't have anything that's, um, well, we can get into it later, but performance, we don't have something that is strictly performance. We have performances that were recorded on video. So we have video of performance. And, and our time-based media curator just mentioned that we newly also have sound art in our, and also sometimes just oh, yeah. for the audience, we'll refer to time-based media artist TVMA, TBMA. So either way, but. That's very exciting as well. Um, jargon. Yes, we love our jargon after all. So specifically for this uh, Converse with a Conservator, you chose to talk about video and performance art. So what is video and performance art and when did video art begin? Yeah, um, so Saisha, um, our, our curator of time-based media art, Saisha Grayson, um, before the pandemic and everything closing, um, had a, a, a small exhibit out in our museum that is now uh, back on view since we are uh, opened again under new, under new rules and under new hours uh, that had, that sort of addressed this um, pairing of video and performance. And uh, I, that was really interesting and so we were gonna do a gallery talk and now it's a virtual talk. Um, a lot of people say that video art started in the 1960s when Sony released this uh, AV3400 Portapack, a very portable video system. Um, Panasonic had one too that you can see here. And uh, for all of us that have um, portable video systems in our pocket right now on a on our cell phones, they seem a lot bulkier, but in 1963, these were like the height of slim down, sleek technology. And uh, just for reference, here's a broadcast television camera from the 1960s. And so you can see that that is quite a size reduction. You wouldn't be able to look that around to do selfies with. Um, and so once these became available, these more, these smaller portable, machines. Uh, they're also a little bit cheaper, not cheap exactly, but cheaper than the broadcast stuff. And uh, artists started being able to avail themselves of the technology. And the, um, the one, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but the story goes that uh, pictured here, Namjoon Paik, um, largely considered the father of video art, um, bought a porta pack one of the first, uh, he's an early adopter of a lot of the technologies, including the Porta Pack. And uh, the Pope was visiting New York and he recorded the Pope. And video art started when he took that recording and went to his friend's place and was showing the video to his friends. So it was a, uh, it's a, it's a exhibition. The, the, the moment of displaying it to people when the art started, not just the act of recording. And then he went on to do all kinds of great stuff. And performance art um, is a lot of different things. It's very hard to define, but it doesn't necessarily, it can use all kinds of media. You know, it could be audio, it could be video, but it could just be dance. It could be some sort of bodily movement. Uh, it could be a happening, some sort of, but it's, it's you know, usually an event. Um, and it starts getting referred to as performance art also in the middle of the, 20th century, mostly, um, for a lot of conceptual artists that are starting to try and think about art not necessarily tied to objects, but tied to processes and uh, performance. So in thinking about performance art, um, how do you go about preserving or documenting performance art? Uh, that's a great question. And um, 
yeah, the, the, a lot of, in the early history of this stuff, a lot of museums did not think that they could collect stuff like performance art or um, anything like that because it would just happen. The performance, whatever it was, would happen and then it would be done. And then it's just this ephemeral thing that's sort of intangible. Video and the availability of this stuff is actually something that um, helps art galleries, museums start to have something tangible to hold on to. And uh, it's related to some other things that are happening in conceptual art around the time where you have somebody like um, Saul LeWitt here, uh, his wall drawing 273 pictured, um, which is in the collection of SF MoMA. And this is something that, this is an artist who, like I said, is very interested in process. So the end result is a drawing, but a lot of what this art is about is when you collect it uh, as a museum, he doesn't give you a finished drawing. He, he gives you a set of, in, he gave a set of instructions. And then part of what the artwork is, is the, is the process to, to redo the art. And so here in the, on the left hand side, you see this sort of like tombstone information uh, is what we call the basic description of who the artist is, what the artwork is called, when's it from, uh, medium that it's on. And, and also in that small text right below the, the medium line, um, you have who the current drawing at, that's on display is by, uh, also who drew it the first time it was ever shown and where that was. And so you get this sort of, with this, now museums start to think, well, okay, here's something that is iterative and, and only exists for a temporary amount of time before it's painted over again, but we can collect it because we have this set of instructions. And then, um, Video technology is another thing that is tangible. If you have a videotape of your performance, then you can hand that videotape to people. And so in our uh, collection, most of our TBMA collection, or a huge percentage of it is video work. And, a, and, a, and then a large percentage of that we have um, via licensing agreements from Electronic Arts Intermix, which is like a sort of like a record label for, for video artists. And this is a way that a lot of, and they're still active, um, but a lot of video artists were, would work with Electronic Arts Intermix. They would give them their master tapes, their finished tapes, whatever it was. Maybe it was a video art, or maybe it was documentation of a performance art piece, uh, or something in between. And then whatever it was, the Electronic Arts Intermix could, you know, send for some kind of a fee uh, artworks to galleries for exhibitions or to send to uh, universities for professors to use in their art classes or to license to museums like ours so that we can show them uh, you know in a number of on a number of occasions and so that that tangibility of a, of a video artwork now allows you to collect something that earlier was thought to be um, uncollectible so how would you say that access to video technology has influenced artists? Yeah, just precisely that and that um, it's, it's can be a way to document a performance artwork. So something that you were already going to do and now you just have a way, a new way to share that or to uh, possibly monetize it if you can sell it to uh, electronic art instruments or you can sell it to museums, um, or you have a way just to, sh to share it more easily. And then you have it as a tool uh, for performance as well. Um, you can manipulate videotape as part of a performance. It becomes sort of an instrument. Or you have people that um, do something in between where they, they envision a work from the get-go as something that's going to, the finished product is going to be a video. Um, but it involves the, what the what the content is has some sort of performative element. So we have uh, clips of two things that may oh. examples. You oh some examples. All right, fire them up. So th these are uh, our works in our collection here. Um, the first I'm going to show is from uh, our archive of Namjoon Paik's work. Um, it's called, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, so let's see, I just have to share first. 
Share. And now start. It's not working for some reason. I'm just going to start this small clip over since I, I don't think it was sharing at first. So uh, that first one is um, Namjoon Paik, and what you're seeing is he's live recording video, and while he's recording uh, over some pre-existing videotape, he's got something else, this video synthesizer that he's messing with to be able to perform the imagery in real time. And so that sort of ghostly, wavy image on top of the uh, image below it that's sort of um, modulating, he, he's controlling that modulation himself in real time, just like you might control the modulation of a guitar or instrument in real time. And our other one is going to be um, by Girl, which is Simone Lee and uh, Chitra Ganesh. And um, this is called, uh, well, here I just show. This is called uh, My Dreams, my, my Works Must Wait Until After Hell. And uh, yeah, that is, if you, if you blink, you sort of miss it, but uh, these are short clips. Uh, that's a, like a 20 minute piece. And could, the performative could element. Could we see that second one again? I feel like it's so subtle. Sure. I will just reshare here. Well, let me get it set up first. Sorry. And have done this quicker this now is in the heat of the moment. The stuff that people love with conservation, you know, you get to see uh -huh. the true guts behind. So if you concentrate on her ribs, you'll be able to see that she's breathing. It's not just a still image. And so this is a, a piece that is thinking about um, a trope in a lot of, uh, in art history of the, of the reclining um, female nude, which is normally someone lying on her side that you're seeing from the front. Uh, and then this is playing with that in a number of ways. One is that you're seeing the person from behind. Um, and the other obviously is that their head is in a pile of rocks. Uh, and so if someone had, the, the thing I think is performative is that somebody actually has to, when you're recording this, has to um, endure the 20 minutes of, of, the, of the take. And um, so that performative element um, is in conversation with the um, painterly compositional uh, aspect of the video that's speaking to that art historical trope. Um, and so th this is something where it's, in my mind, like a, a, this is a video artwork that has a performative element as opposed to the, the Paik work, which is a video performance where the, the video is really this live instrument in that scenario. And so there's a whole various spectra of, of ways that artists can make use of this new technology. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of creative people can do a lot of different creative things with the same tools. Now, are the, both of these artworks up in SAM right now? Uh, yeah. The, and, the, yes. Because there was a question asking if the Simone Lee piece is a live 20 minute piece, um, but it's from what I remember, it's in a video, right? It's, it's a video that's being looped. So it's the end product of that artwork is a, is a video. Um, yeah. 
And so with that, that piece is on view and there's a different PAKE video up now, video art piece, right? Global Groove? That's right, it's Global Groove, that's up. Yeah, you know, what I was showing was um, uh, 92369 with David Atwood. And which I know was never broadcast playing. live, but was recorded with the help of a lot of people while he was at WGBH in Boston as an artist in residence in 1969. And I know we, you were mentioning the difference of archives as well as uh, media conservation. We actually have at SAM um, a PAIC archive. So we do have a really extension, extensive collection of his works. That's that, the, a little nuanced, right? Yeah, so um, we have a, SAM is an art museum. We have a collection of artworks. So a lot of the things in the collection are finished artworks. The Namjoon PAIC archive, which came in 2009, um, has some finished artworks, but it also has a lot of his studio material. So there's a lot of um, televisions, a lot of guts of televisions, uh, a lot of uh, paper material, um, just a lot of stuff. So archives, this is a lot of stuff that was around that will help uh, interested researchers and um, others try to get a sense of what his uh, working processes were like. It's a it's an incredible resource. And since you're now kind of parsing out archives versus conservation and how they work together as well, I'm curious, how is time-based media conservation different than a more traditional art conservation that we might um, see in the other parts of Lunder Conservation Center? Um, yes, yeah, so one, one thing I said earlier is uh, with objects like paintings and uh, and and sculptures that they're they're normally thought of they have of having certain dimensions um, in three dimensions you know the, the, the paintings are given width and height sculptures are given height width depth uh, they're thought of usually as um, as static the artist works for a while with a, with a canvas or, or with a, a piece of marble and at the end of it you have a, a painting or a sculpture and that's a finished artwork and at that moment you sort of have this in, in the sort of conception of traditional conservation for many um, centuries you have this finished um, sort of ideal state and um, if you put that at time zero then as time moves forward um, stuff might might happen and an acceptable change uh, to an artwork, it's generally something you would call patina, like uh, happens with bronze sculptures. Um, an unacceptable change, like someone's arm falling off or cracks in the paint or discoloration uh, over the years or you know a tear in the canvas, that's, that's damage. Um, with with time-based media art, and, and those things are also unique, right? If you have, you only have one copy of Mona Lisa, you only have one. Um, and with time-based media art, these things not only as a part of their very nature change over time, whether it's a film changes uh, imagery because you have all these different frames of imagery, it has to take place over time. Um, you also have films that uh, because they're going through a projector the first time you see it it looks different from the eighth time you see it because by the eighth time you see it it's got all kinds of scratches and dust from the from the mechanism of going through a, a projector it's quite film projector is actually quite a violent thing um, so there's that element of change um, and copying is in the very heart of the creative process for films videos anything using um, data software-based art or video games, is that you have to be able to make copies. You have to, um, if you just wanted to show a film, like because the film gets torn up by the projector, you have to have a bunch of them on hand. Um, same thing with old videotapes. And then even if you're showing digital files, which uh, are theoretically perfect copies of each other, you, you still have the, the player um, that'll die. So. Things will, things will change over time. And that's just built into the process. So that makes me think we've had some questions about um, thinking about 
copies and things like that. So one question that we got is, is there a general rule of thumb for how many museums or collectors can own a particular film or documentation for a performance since couldn't that mean that potentially every major museum could own an artwork? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And the, the sort of um, false scarcity market solution that uh, people came up with to that is this practice of additioning. And um, so one thing that we keep track of if you're in the market for a, 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 a media artwork is normally some information they'll give is, uh, you know, this is the name of the artwork, it's by this person, this is the year it was made. It is the third of five, edition three of five. And uh, what that tells you is that, um, you know, theoretically, if it's, a, if it's a videotape, I could make copies of a videotape till, you know, the, till the cows come home. But the idea here is that there's only going to be five that have the artist's stamp of authenticity in terms of being able to sell that to be in a collection. Well, we had a follow-up question to that is, do you have experience in making new physical copies of old film reels? Yeah, um, I, I don't personally do it, but we will work with labs for film um, where, so I don't do, I don't personally do the film processing, but we'll work with a lab, color lab in Rockville, Maryland. One of the last surviving ones, a really good one, and right in our backyard. So very convenient to have them around. Uh, we showed film as recently as uh, 2015 in the galleries uh, as part of uh, a show that was called um, Watch This, Revelations in Media Art, and there were two films that were on loopers in that show. So um, a special way of showing film where it just continuously uh, repeats without you having to rewind. And um, we had to generate new copies of the films for that. All right, we have got a lot of questions really, and this is excellent. So. Along that line, but slightly different, is a question. Do you have a template, contract, or interview for enabling the re-performance of performance arts? And in your opinion, is that effective? Are there holes, of, in your opinion, with that? Uh, the short answer to that is no, we do not. We haven't uh, collected anything yet where we have the rights to re-perform. And, um, so all we have in the collection are, are videos, documentate, like a document of a performance. Um, but so far, um, what we have been building up to, I think if we, if we were interested in something um, that we have been building up a practice towards that, which is either through um, interviews or through artist questionnaires. And that is a process in which we are trying to, you know, ascertain the degree of, um, of change that can be introduced uh, to an artwork, uh, whatever the artist is comfortable with. Because as we're, um, as we collect something, we have to deal uh, with obsolescence. Um, I have an obsolescence slide here. Uh, these are a bunch of videotape formats. When they came about, when they started becoming obsolescent, meaning um, all the companies that make the, the tapes, that make the uh, players to play the tapes, uh, stop supporting them. And that happens with video, it happens with uh, all kinds of technologies. And so in, in media art, then you see a lot more frequently, uh, because you have copies already, um, then you see the idea of, um, of migration, which is uh, a way to refer to, like digitization is a form of migration because you're usually talking about an analog media like a videotape being turned into a digital file. And so you're taking some one technology and migrating it to another. Um, so our practice of, we, we would have to, we would have to change it for, for performance art, but I'll just leave it at that. But we, we are trying to think about obsolescence and, and in so doing, we've come up with questions to ask artists. And so I think we'd have a good jumping off point if we were to collect a performance artwork that we were intending to re-perform. So along the lines of artist intent, which you just mentioned, there's a couple questions about it. So one question is, do you seek the permission of an artist when changing formats? For example, CRT to projection to laptop? 
Yeah. Um, yes, if possible. And, um, and, and there's a range of possibilities when things are appropriate when, when it's not. So here, here's the piece that we were looking at, um, some inf additional information. And this is something that once it was finished, it's a, it's a videotape. And now, if we were to show it, um, we would do the same thing that we're doing with Global Groove, which is the one that's on view, uh, which is we're going to, we can still, we still have a collection of working CRT televisions, the old style of, of TV that um, the standard definition video uh, was originally shown on. But we aren't exhibiting um, videotape. We are exhibiting a, a digital file, and that's going to be the setup uh, most times you see a video in a museum or a gallery setting. Um, and the reason that that's been acceptable to a lot of people to become the standard practice is that you can capture enough of the analog videotapes, what we would call significant characteristics in a digital file. Um, things like the, the resolution, the width and height of, uh, of the image, uh, the color space, how the colors look, um, the frame rate, uh, interlacement, which is just how the how the image is drawn by CRT television. So you can tell the digital file basically that it's going to be displayed on something like a CRT, so that it displays correctly and and retains enough of the visual character thanks to the display on that um, older technology. And then uh, I have next door. Uh, by the same artist, a work called Zen for TV, and this is uh, this is a television that's playing an image not generated from a videotape or a video feed uh, or a video camera. It, it, that image is coming from within the television itself because the artist went in, uh, snipped some wires, and and broke the TV in a way that when you turn it on. It can't travel, the thing that paints the screen can't travel up and down. So it can only go left and right. And all of the electrons that it's spitting out get collapsed into this line. And so this is something where, yeah, you could make a digital file of a white line. Um, and in that way, you know, migrate the piece. It doesn't feel, uh, we can't talk to Namjoon Paik about it because he passed away in 2006. Uh, enough enough people that he worked with, enough people that care for um, the the collection of his of his works and his and his legacy tend to agree. This one doesn't feel like one that you can migrate. It has to be a CRT, uh, and you have to take care of this one because it's this very specific intervention into how the CRT worked that makes this sort of sculptural visual effect. So we have gotten a couple questions about Paik's work specifically. So um, one of the questions are, is were the original Paik works done on three quarters tape and have they all been digitized? And once digitized, do you keep the original? Yeah, um, everything from the archive that was on videotape, um, we have digitized and we are keeping the tapes. Uh, the reason you do, you keep it is because um, well, some, when videotape was new, a bunch of people thought, well, that's going to be the thing that outlives film. And they did this thing where they, they translated all their films to videos. And, uh, and then that video started to die long before the film did. And now they have this new, uh, you know, there's a lot of new digital scanners that look great. And so then they have to digitize the film now. So they did an immediate step for in the end, it didn't work out. So we never know what technology is around the corner. So you want to keep everything. We're hoarders. Said like that, again, that crosses over into the archival, right? Save everything. Um, another question about Paik, um, mm -hmm. artwork that you haven't mentioned, but I know is a, a favorite, and I'll put the link in the chat box, is Paik's Electronic Superhighway. So a question is, how do you keep that piece going even though those TVs are not made anymore? So going back to the CRT. Um, yeah, we, we keep an eye out for spare ones all the time. And um, there's still a few places where you can get either refurbished or just used 
televisions. And so we tend to make orders every year. And, um, and then there tends to be a, a time in the year where we go and, and change out a swath of them. Uh, so it's basically a big game of whack-a-mole or something like that. There is uh, hope though. There's somebody out, a, a former assistant of Pake's, uh, him and someone else have developed, have redeveloped. Um, when CRTs were brand new, they were very expensive and it was actually cheaper to repair them than to get a new one. And so there's this fabrication process to repair them. They, they work with uh, vacuum tubes. So the glass that you're looking at is the, the big end of a vacuum tube and it's really small at the, at the other end. Um, I have, hang on. you can see there's sort of this tube here where, where the letter F is. And so um, that uh, has a substance on it that has a lot of electrons. And when you heat it up, it uh, spits out a lot of electrons and that wears out. And, and electrons are key to how the image is made. So um, for a long time, it's like, well, once the tube is worn out, then, then you're done. But they've rediscovered this old fabrication technique where they can actually cut open the vacuum tube, glass tube, uh, rejuvenate the electron source, and then reseal the vacuum. And you basically have the television operating for another generation. It could be like 15, 20, 30 years out of that. Um, we haven't, I know of places that have successfully used uh, that treatment, but we haven't done it ourselves, but we are looking into it. It would be a, a big investment, but um, I, think, I think he's worth the investment. So. Um, we've got a, a bunch of other questions. Uh, an interesting one we've got a couple questions about is, do you consider David Hockney's snail space, and again, I'll put the link into the chat box, a time-based media piece? That's one in our collection that has um, a sort of hybrid in, in terms of how the conservation department deals with it. I sometimes am asked about it, but that mostly falls under um, objects and paint and paintings conservation. Um, but it does have lights that are on a, on a program system. So there is an element that um, is time-based media. Yeah. All oh, right. This is a some a interesting question about thinking about other artworks in our space. Do you ever exhibit analog formats using analog sources? And if so, do you, what are some examples? Do you create new analog preservation copies of work just for your access or just on a preservation standpoint? Yeah. Well, I've, uh, I I started in 2015, and when I started, uh, um, Revelations and Media Art Show was up and that was showing film and um we we can still show film we also did a film screening night uh early on in my tenure here uh where we were showing actual film and we have we had one we've collected things by since i've been here by jonas mikas and by bill brand and um Bill Brand is who taught me film preservation at NYU and is an excellent artist and a, a film preservationist. So when we got stuff from him, he had made new preservation materials. And when we got um, the Jonas Mikas uh, films, we got a, a preservation element. And so with, with, with that means with analog stuff, you always have generations and usually for, for you know, you make a copy of a copy of a copy. So the film, the video camera or the film camera you shoot and then you have your camera original uh, and that's just the only one so you can't just give that to somebody because then you you're left with nothing so you make a you edit and then you make a, a, a the final copy and then you make some special copies of that and then those copies make a bunch of copies and then those copies it's like this reverse pyramid scheme so that you're protecting the more original generations and so if you're somebody into preservation you want those original generations um, the end result is usually what we call a release print. And um, so we do want something further back than a release print so that we can make new prints. Um, because as I said, if you're going to show them, you're going to wear them out. 
All right, so we have time for one question. This is a doozy, so you just gotta be as brief as possible. I think it's a really great question. What and when do you predict might be the next generation of conservation after digital files? Well. After digital files. Right? Well, <laughs> um, well are, are they talking about being able to store stuff in DNA? So maybe we could be walking repositories. There you have it. I love it. Um, thank you so much, Dan. We did not get to nearly enough questions. So I rambled too much on a couple of those. I'm sorry, everyone. Well, this is great. We'll definitely do more. Um, I just put in a link for our upcoming ones in November and December. So please sign up. I also put a link to our survey. And if you have burning questions, feel free to email me. I'll put in my email right now and we will see if we can convince Dan to, to respond to a few extra through email. So thanks again, Dan. This was really fun. And thank you to everyone. Until yeah, next you. time. Thank you, everybody.